afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Jennifer, I wanted to thank you first and foremost. You have been a steadfast influence in our art community, really encouraging the artists to have two shows a year. I've learned so much, and my work has grown through your help. So I want to thank you very much for that. And Lisa, thank you. And my number one fan, my husband, Nick, thank you. And Miles, so nice to have you back in our lives and learn you as an adult. It's really been great. So um, today, um, I thought what I would do is talk first specifically about the work in this show. And then I brought some of my collage work to show what my current work is. So um, again, cultural biases. We all have them, um, and they're difficult, and they hold us back. So um, my influence from this was a documentary that I watched a few years ago by James Baldwin, and it was so touching. It was called I Am Not Your Negro. And James Baldwin was born in like 1936 in Harlem. His father was a preacher and a very successful preacher at a local church. And James ends up in high school becoming a preacher himself at another church and becomes very successful. So when he writes, he's lyrical, he's strong, he's precise, and he gives us an insight into the black culture that's truly impossible for us as whites to understand. And he had this really strong line in his documentary, just looked right at the camera and he goes, America will not be a whole country until we have included and embraced the Negro people as Americans. And I felt very strongly about that. So I thought I would talk because this is the influence that brought me to this work. And there was just a current article in the New Yorker and there's just, I'm gonna read just three paragraphs because he's such a good speaker. So um, this one, the first paragraph is about when he first understood the difficulty and the withholding that he was gonna experience in America as a black man. So he's 14 at the time. He said, I began during my 14th year for the first time in my life, afraid of the evil within me and afraid of the evil without. What I saw around me that summer in Harlem was what I had always seen. Nothing had changed. But now, without warning, the whores and the pimps and the racketeers on the avenue had become a personal menace. It had not before occurred to me that I could become one of them. But now I realize that we had been produced by the same circumstances. Many of my comrades were clearly headed for the avenue, and my father said that I was headed that way too. My friends began to drink and smoke and embarked at first avid, then groaning on their sexual careers. Girls only slightly older than I who sang in the choir or taught Sunday school, the children of holy parents underwent before my eyes their incredible metamorphosis of which the most bewildering aspect was not their budding breasts or their rounding behinds, but something deeper and more subtle in their eyes, their heat, their odor, and the inflection of their voices like strangers on the avenue, they became, in a twinkling of an eye, unutterably different and fantastically present. And yet there was something deeper than these changes and less definable that frightened me. Isn't he good? And he's just, um, and I began to feel in a boy a curious, wearing, bewildering despair, as though they were now settling in for the long, hard winter of life. I did not know then what it was that I was reacting to. I put it to myself that they were letting themselves go in the same way that the girls were destined to gain as much weight as their mothers. The boys, it was clear, would rise no higher than their fathers. Schools began to reveal itself, therefore, as a child's game that one could not win. And the boys dropped out of school. My father wanted me to do the same. I refused even though I no longer had the illusions of what an education could do for me. I had already encountered too many college graduate handymans. 
My friends were downtown, busy as they put it, fighting the man. They began to care less about the way they looked and dressed and the things they did. Presently, one found two and three and four in the hallway sharing jugs of wine or bottles of whiskey, talking, cursing, sometimes weeping, lost and unable to say what it was that oppressed them, except that they knew it was the man, the white man, and there seemed to be no way whatever to remove this cloud that stood between them and the sun, between them and life and power, between them and whatever it was that they wanted. One did not have to be very bright to realize how little one could do to change one's situation. One did not have to be abnormally sensitive to be worn down to a cutting edge by the incessant and gratuitous humiliation and danger one encountered every working day, all day long. It just gives a sense of how difficult. So this is the last paragraph, and this is he turned to the church to try to prevent himself. He was just trying to keep himself from that place on the streets. And there were very few choices because there wasn't opportunity. So he joined the church, became a pastor, a preacher, and then he saw the same thing. He saw pastors, you know, getting the big catalogs, getting the money. They go forward while everybody else is just giving their pennies away and not getting anywhere. So he became discouraged there. A loss of faith. All I really remember is the pain, the unspeakable pain. It was as though I were yelling up to heaven and heaven could not hear me. And if heaven would not hear me, if love could not descend from heaven to wash me, to make me clean, then utter disaster was my portion. Yes, it does indeed mean something, something unspeakable, to be born in a white country, an Anglo, anti-sexual country, black. You very soon, without knowing it, give up all hope of communion. Black people mainly look down or look up, but do not look at each other, not at you, and white people mainly look away. And the universe is simply a sounding drum. There is no way, no way whatever, it seems, then and has seemed sometimes since to get through a life, to love your wife and children or your friends or your mother and father or to be loved. The universe, which is not merely the stars and the moon and the planet, flowers, grass and trees, but other people, has evolved no term for your existence, made no room for you, if love will not swing open the gates. And if one despairs, as who has not, of human love, God's love alone is left. But God, I felt, even then, so long ago, on that tremendous floor, unwillingly, is white. And if his love was so great, and if he loved all his children, why were we, the blacks, cast down so far? So that left him with pretty much nothing. Um, so how to express that, <laughs> you know, to go forward? Um, and the New Yorker, a few years ago, began really bringing in photographers and photography into their magazine. And they've had just these great images of blacks cliches, ghetto blasters, big jewelry, guys sitting on couches with money, cash in their hands, women with big butts. So I have all these images that I really like, but it was very hard to not go in a cliched way. So then I just went, you know, we have all these cultures and yet we're not seeing them. We don't really see through anything. And so that's what I was feeling. We're looking, but we are not seeing. So I took some of the images that I had, and then I was looking across my living room and I saw the Georgia O'Keeffe flower book. And she did the same thing with her work. She was feeling that we don't look at flowers. So she wanted to paint them large to see if we could really see the beauty of them. So that's the combination. It's very simple. Um, in my collage work, I do like to have as few pieces as possible. I just think to me that's really interesting to see if I can get something that says something with just a couple piece, pieces of um, different papers. So um, 
There we have it. I love this woman's face. When I put that magnolia over it, I just really enjoyed it. I liked how it looked. I thought it came across strongly. Um, and then I tried a series of them, as you often do. So I was going through the books, and it's, it's hard. I didn't quite have all the impetus, but I, I really enjoyed the colors of this. I thought he was a very beautiful man, lit really well. His skin was just glorious to me. And then I found this flower that reflected it. So that is my current work for this show. So then, um, as being a photographer, since I was 15, I was a photographer for my school newspaper, I've had a camera all my life, I um, have tons of photos and it's like what to do with them. So then Jennifer, a few years ago, had a show, let me find this, <clears throat> and I can't remember the name of it, I was looking for it the other day. And it was something where it was like recycling work. Oh, it was found photos. Oh, found, well, there we go, found photos. So I took this photograph. When I took this photograph when I was in high school. I found it in my mom's stuff. And so I decided to embroider it. <laughs> so that was my first try at this. And it's difficult to pierce the paper, so it was very simple photography. So that was my first one with collage and then you had another show so I went all right I'll try this again so this is a photograph from Wright Park taken a few years ago in the fog so on this one I really experimented with with um, embroidery and so I um, embroidered a lot of flowers on it and it's really, I like it. I think it's really pretty, but it's very labor intensive and you can crinkle the paper really easily. Um, but I still enjoyed it. And then <laughs> you continue to have shows. So I continued to play. And then I just fell in love with collage. So I have a few of them. I brought maybe <laughs> 10 different collages. So I continued, I have one that is, um, where is that? Ooh. This one is another, this one is an embroider. And you can see, oops, well, now that it's fallen out, you can see all the stitches on the back. So this is Shackleton's last photo when he was going to the Antarctic. And he goes, this is his quote, he dies like 500, I can't remember, not, not a mile from the North Pole. And he goes, my journey has come to an end. And he's such a grand character. So another embroidered piece. And then I just kept playing. You know, sometimes I have, uh, sometimes I wonder just <laughs> what it's all coming to. So there's lots of pieces in this, but I really try to blend them so you can't really tell. Like this eye is from another image, but it fit, jawline, eye. So I have fun with those. This one is called, For Once She Threatened to Not Go Quietly. And then this one is Mom told us to wait right here, but we've been waiting here for hours. So I like these uh, quirky, dark <laughs> themes. <laughs> this one, of course, is honestly, how much longer do we have to wait for a woman president? So you can't really always tell, it's just the face. This is a Seattle artist. I really like how he does these women's faces. So that seemed to fit with Van Gogh pretty well. Um, Let's see, um, this was the first one I did very simply. It's called Deer in the Headlights. Um, let's see, this one was a very intricate cutting. This was a photograph I took at Lake Crescent. And then I switched up the women to make this one called Evening Flow. Um, then for all the art, critics and historian. This was um, It's Casual Friday for Blue Boy. <laughs> 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 I 
I barely know you, but I love you. <laughs> um, this is good, I like this one. Some people call it hoarding, I call it creative organization. <laughs> so that's the gist. I don't know how, but I'm going to blame you for everything. So, that is my work. I'm really enjoying doing collages. I find that it um, really brings me to the blank page, and I really like it. I never know where it's going to go. I'm a reader, so I've kept quotes from books forever, and so I like to kind of apply the quotes to things as well. So that's my talk, everybody. Do I have any questions? <laughs> Seeing my biggest fan. <laughs> I have a question about um, the uh, threading on the photographs. Is it hard not to tear them? Yes. Because I wasn't sure. About yes, that. yes. It's very difficult. It's very time consuming. Um, I have. Uh, this is from the New Yorker, so it's oh. just a magazine. So it's not even that great of paper. Um, I, haven't, I haven't figured out how I'm going to complete this, what I'm going to have around it. I've been printing out pictures from Antarctica, but it kind of detracts from it, so I haven't resolved that yet. But yeah, you have to go very carefully. You know, it's like this so cigar there was, was tricky. Right there. I know, that's what you can think. That's like, you know, you could be right at the very end and mess up really well. <laughs> so that's why it's really fun to be a little more loose and not always be doing the embroidery, but I do like the embroidery. I think it's really fun. Voila. Thank you very much. <laughs>